Hello and welcome to MakeLock number 17. In this video I would like to show you why and how I built this outside station to quantify afterglows and to enable an automatic detection of afterglows. Why did I build the station? Of course for me the technical side is very interesting with a microcontroller, database, Raspberry Pi and gathering these measurement data over a very long period of time. And also I have always been interested in optical phenomena, especially if I can witness them with my own eyes. Also the question is interesting for me if the afterglows can be quantified. My aim here is to build the station and gather data over a long period of time and to find out if a one pixel detector is sufficient to characterize afterglows. Also this is the first project for me where I have used a 3D printer. With the station I can measure the following values. For air I can measure the temperature, humidity, pressure, volatile organic components, CO2, PM2.5 and PM10. Also the roof temperature is measured via an external sensor and the internal case temperature where the microcontroller is. Optical data measured include the ultraviolet values from the sky and an RGB sensor pointing to the east and another RGB sensor pointing to the west. The latter two sensors are relevant for the afterglow detection. Also I have added a lightning detector and, because I had a free pin on the microcontroller, a tipping bucket rain gauge. Here you see node red. The data from the weather station is sent every 5 seconds via MQTT. It is combined and fed into the influx database. For displaying the data I use Grafana. Here on the right you see all the values from the air measurements, so air pressure, air resistance, temperature from the inside of the box and the roof, the air temperature measured in the pipe, the air humidity and air particulate matter and CO2. On the left we have the precipitation, as you can see there was no precipitation. The data from the lightning detection sensor ignore this, I couldn't get the sensor to give me reliable results yet. We have ultraviolet measurements, we have the raw color sensor outputs, we have the lux values from the east and the west and we have the color temperature. This is yesterday and I would like to point out this day from yesterday and as you can see there was a drop in color temperature in the evening. So within let's see, around 10 minutes, the color temperature dropped from over 6000 Kelvin to below 2900 Kelvin and this is really really red. This is the west where the sun was going down and the scene looked like this. We are now looking into the west. It can be seen that the sky is covered in red color also when we look up a bit. So it seems that a drop in color temperature by 3000 kelvins within 10 minutes can be used to automatically detect afterglows. As a second indicator the lux value can be used. This is why you can see a small increase in the western lux value and its local maximum is where the local minimum of the color temperature value is. I think the reason for the small increase in the lux value is that light from all over the sky is now scattered onto our RGB sensor, whereas if there wasn't an afterglow the light scattering wouldn't occur. Let's have a look at the data from a duration of 5 days. Here we have the lux values. The green curve shows the lux value to the east, the yellow curve shows the lux value to the west. And you can see when the sun is in the sunrise the lux value is higher in the east and at midday it turns. Then in the west we have the higher lux value. This seems to happen almost every day. So the first four days were sunny days and you can see that the break even is around 12 o'clock. I didn't position the station exactly, I just put it on the roof. So it fits pretty well that the turning point here is around 12 o'clock. What you can also see 
is that this was a cloudy day and the curves are getting much more noisier here. Let's have a look at the color temperature. So in the east when the sun is going up here the green graph the color temperature is always a bit warmer and this changes in the evening than where the sun is in the west the color temperature is warmer and so this is the same for the whole day you can see that here when it started to become cloudy also the color temperature for the west and for the east became more similar let's now have a look at the ultraviolet measurements the ultraviolet measurements are performed by pointing the sensor to the northern sky so it only captures the scattered ultraviolet radiation these five days were all sunny except the last one this became cloudy in the afternoon near my place the federal office of radiation protection has a measurement station for ultraviolet radiation this graph shows the hour of the day and the intensity of the ultraviolet radiation this gray graph gives us the clear sky prediction. The measurement results are shown here as bar graphs. I started saving these pictures for some days to compare them to my measured values. Let's compare the values from the federal office with my measurements. So let's just pick these three days for comparison. So my first impression is that I shouldn't trust the absolute values of the sensor I have used. As you can see, on this day the sensor gave me a higher UV index than on this day. But from the official measurements you can see that we had a higher value on this day compared to this day. For relative changes in the ultraviolet radiation this sensor performs ok. Here in the official measurement we see a drop in ultraviolet intensity in the morning. We can see the same drop also here in my measurement. Since I save my data every 5 seconds I can see quick changes in the UV index and in all other values. I think in these measurements an averaging is used that averages over a small temporal bin. This is why here only a small step can be seen whereas I have a spike here in my measurement. Let's go back to the dashboard and that's it about the optical measurements in the station and this is the focus of the video so I'm not going to explain the other sensors here but now I'm going to show you how I built the station. So the first thing I did was looking for materials with a good ultraviolet transmittance. Here is the result of my research. I found a material with 92% uh, of transmittance. And another good thing here is the red curve here shows that the transmittance even gets better after 4000 hours of exposure. And this is what I needed. So I ordered a sample tube of this material and started building. When I received the tube I cut it diagonally and grinded the surface so it's flat and fits onto the case. To close the end of the tube I made a lid of acrylic. To access the tube from the case I cut a hole into the case and I was grinding the surface of the case so the epoxy resin has better contact. I only wanted one single connection to power all the electronics and to program the microcontroller. So I was using a USB to RJ45 connector. Here you can see the lid after grinding and before applying epoxy resin to it. Then I had a problem. I couldn't use the contained connector here shown to the left because I don't have a crimping tool and the metal parts of the contained connector and my network cable are of different length. So this plastic part can't be used with my network cable. So I designed a new part which fits to my cable and 3D printed it. The finished 3D printed part worked as expected. It fitted perfectly into the connector and it made a good connection to the box. Here are the three main parts of the station. 
Here is the pipe with the air sensors, here is the main case with the microcontroller and the optical sensors and the precipitation sensor. At first let's have a look at the air sensors. The air sensors are all in this pipe. I will explain all the sensors and their arrangement later. This pipe has three openings, two down facing and one up facing. I made 3D printed lattice frames for the down facing openings and also a water protection spiral which looks like this. Also I added 3D printed spacers to hold the aluminum sun shields. Let's have a look at the main case. The main case can be opened from the top and you can see I added a lightning sensor for fun. Let's have a look at the connections. Here is an external temperature probe to measure the roof surface temperature and here goes the programming and main power connector. The external connector is connected to an Ethernet cable which goes to an RJ45 to USB adapter and this is connected to the ESP8266. The back side of this board was made quick and dirty because I thought this station is just for a test run. Let's have a look at the optical sensors here. We have the ultraviolet sensor here at the top, we have the RGB sensor facing the west and one RGB sensor facing the east. This is the cable that connects all the air sensors in that tube and this is the cable which connects the precipitation sensor. So for now I would like to explain which sensors I have here and why. First I have air measurements, then I have optical sensors and I have a precipitation sensor. The air sensors are pretty common I guess. It's a sensor a BME 680 from Bosch and it measures uh, the temperature, the humidity, the air pressure and the volatile organic components. Furthermore I have an MHZ19 for CO2 measurement and an SDS011 for the particle measurement PM2.5 and PM10. All of these sensors are installed in a pipe to protect them from rain and direct sunlight. Let's have a look at the air sensors. This is the central part of the pipe and we have the MHZ19 here soldered to the top of the STS011 sensor. It looks like this from the top. We have the SDS011 here and the MHZ19 here. The SDS is read out via serial port and the MHZ19 is read out via PWM. Let's turn the pipe around to have a look into the other end. You can see the BME 680 sensor here which is read out via I2C. The optical sensors are quite uncommon for a weather station because imagine a compass and we have the north and we have the south and we have the east and the west. I would like to measure the color of the sky so sometimes the sunrise which is in the east is of a very red color and sometimes the sunset which is in the west has a red color and I would like to measure the color of the sunrise and the sunset and compare because is there something in common if there's a day with a red sunrise will also the sunset be red and does this have something to do with the particles in the air? So I would like to measure the, the color temperature of the sky and this was uh, yeah, quite a task to fulfill 
because if the sun is shining directly onto the sensor, the sensor is fully saturated and I can't measure the color temperature anymore. I will show you later how I designed and printed uh, the 3D case to prevent the sun from saturating the sensors. I have an RGB sensor pointing to the west and an RGB sensor pointing to the uh, east and they also have a common channel so these are two sensors here and I needed a um, I2C uh, switch here because they have the same fixed address and for sensors here I was using a TCS 34725 for both and additionally I have an ultraviolet sensor uh, uh, VEML 6075 for ultraviolet measurements. I have two DS18B20 temperature sensors. One is outside measuring the roof surface temperature and the other is inside this case to check that the case doesn't overheat when it's exposed to the sun. And I have a precipitation sensor which is just one read contact and connected to the interrupt of the ESP8266. I have used a tipping bucket precipitation sensor which consists of a fixed part where the water enters from the top in the middle. And we have a moving part, the scale part, with a magnet in the divider. Here we have two water reservoirs. So we have the fixed part and the scale-like part and when uh, the water comes in from the middle fills one bucket until the scale-like part flicks. The magnet passes by the reed switch. I measured the amount of each reservoir here with a syringe and from here I could calculate the precipitation values in the ESP8266. Here we see the arrangement of the optical sensors. We have the two RGB sensors here and the ultraviolet sensor and an I2C multiplexer in the middle. This sensor here looks into the west and we have to prevent it from looking directly into the sun also as the other sensor because then it will be fully saturated and it cannot determine the sky's color index. So we need to have a shadow wall in front of it so it only looks into the sky and not into the sun. The sun's position changes throughout the year and also throughout the day. So we have to find a way that the two RGB sensors are in shadow for the whole year. The Wikipedia page explains this pretty well. In the summer solstice the sun has its highest point. In the winter solstice it has its lowest point. I can design it for this case but also the sun changes over the day. And this graph shows the sun's position throughout the year and for each time of the day, for each day in the year. The outer circle indicate the degrees of the azimuth, whereas the inner circles indicate the inclination. The task is to design a case which casts a shadow onto both sensors throughout the day in summer solstice and throughout the day in winter solstice throughout the year. These curves help to find an appropriate curve in the CAD tool where this case was designed. So why does this case have this shape with the long holes here in the east and in the west? I started with this tube which is a model of the transparent tube which contains the optical sensors. The sensors are arranged here. Here is the ultraviolet sensor in the middle here is the sensor, the RGB sensor, looking to the west and here is the RGB sensor looking to the east. I designed the sun's path in summer solstice, which I can activate here. This is a model of the sun's path at the place where I live. 
on June 21st, the summer solstice. This is south, this is north, and this is east, and this is the west. So the sun on sunrise comes up here at this point and travels along this path until it reaches its highest point and then goes back and here we are under the horizon we have the sunset. The case that I have built looks like this. So why do we have this shape with the long holes here on both sides? You can see if we look from the sun's view and the sensor for looking into the east is placed here. From the sun's view we can never see the sensor itself. It doesn't matter where we are, we can never look into the sensor. Behind this case there are the pipes with the air sensors and behind the pipes there's a chimney. So the chimney casts a shadow onto the case when the sun is in the south. So this case is designed to block the sun from reaching the sensors when the sun is in the east and in the west. To prevent the case from heating up I have added two wings on this side and on this side. The sun will strike this surface and heat it up and also on the other side. But because there's air in between it prevents the inner case to heat up. The same applies to the wing on the other side also there is air in between. When the sun travels along this path it will never shine onto the sensor now. Also the sensor only sees the parts of the sky with a lower inclination where the afterglow usually happens. In the middle of the case there is a hole for the ultraviolet sensor which is placed here. To prevent light scattering from the outer case into the sensor I have chosen a round shape here and later I have painted this area black. So how does this case look like when it's built? As you can see here's some warping of this 3D print but since this is in the back of the case it doesn't matter, it doesn't have an effect on the shadows or the sensors so this is fine. You can also see that I used adhesive tape to prevent the 3D print from separating from the bed. At the end I'm removing the tape first this print came out pretty well and I didn't have to do too much rework to it. In comparison, the 3D printed part that comes on the top of the air sensor pipe didn't come out very well. It lost contact with the bed and I removed the part which wasn't well printed. I have no idea how well PLA withstands outside weather conditions, so I applied a clear coating to it. I used epoxy resin to glue aluminum foil to the shadow wings to better reflect the sunlight. After applying the black paint I assembled the station. By using wire I can connect all the components firmly together. Using wires also facilitates later surfacing. Here in this thermal camera footage you can see that it was a good idea to separate the air sensors from the microcontroller case. So I'm removing the water protection spiral and the shadow case and you can see that the microcontroller emits the most heat of all of the components here. This was a quite long video so I hope nevertheless you enjoyed it and maybe you have learned something. So see you soon!